All right. Well, we hope most people have joined by now. Eduardo, are you ready to kick it off? Yes, I am. Can you hear me well, Morgan? Yes, I can. All right, I'm okay. going to end the slides just briefly to show our faces for a second. Say hello. Great. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. So we are delighted to be here today to talk about the mobile fraud during this pandemic. Um, my name is Eduardo. I'm here with Morgan Grundy. We are both directors of customer success at Incognia, in respectively Brazil and in the U.S. So before we get started, I want to provide a little background on Incognia. We are the industry leader in location behavioral biometrics for mobile fraud. This company was founded in Brazil around 10 years ago, and we just launched it in the U.S. this year. So we are going to take the next 20 minutes to talk about some insights in this mobile fraud and the pandemic, and then we are going to up to Q&A. So welcome, and I hope you enjoy. Great, thanks so much. We'll transition to the agenda. Okay, well, we're gonna kick off by talking about the changes brought on by COVID, focusing on those that really laid the foundation for the fraud growth that we're seeing right now. We're gonna dig into a few types of fraud and the techniques that the fraudsters are capitalizing upon. And then we'll share a few of our observations and open it up for q a if there's time. All right. So let's briefly recap the events that lay the foundation for this fraud growth that we're seeing across the markets of Brazil and the US. COVID-19 and the measures taken to contain it have created a ripple effect. The pandemic affected every aspect of our lives suddenly and dramatically. Social distancing measures meant everyone had to begin working from home. People were more distracted than ever, trying to maintain productivity at work with new remote tools, balancing child and elder care without help. Business closures, furloughs, and widespread layoffs meant that more work, work was being distributed to fewer people and added to a general feeling of discontent. Digital services became a safe lifeline and saw usership skyrocket, and governments began distributing economic assistance programs. What is most remarkable and important to this fraud story is that all of these changes occurred practically overnight. Let's take a look at the two countries side by side to note their similarities and try to discern why they have become global hotspots, both for COVID and fraud. Brazil and the US are among the top 10 largest countries in the world by population. Unfortunately, they currently rank number one and two for the most confirmed coronavirus cases as well. Our current leaders are often compared and both countries took a similar approach to the pandemic which has crippled our economies and brought unemployment to an all-time high. In the US, for example, we currently have 51 million unemployed. In an effort to diminish the financial impact of the virus on the populations of Brazil and America, both governments have distributed large-scale subsidies payments. Dudu, will you yeah, tell us about Brazil? Sure. Um, in Brazil, the situation is much the same, yet we are starting from a much weaker position economically as the U.S. GDP is around 20 times greater than Brazilian GDP. Um, here, the government is already familiar with assisting those um, income, low-income population. But as the pandemic struck many employments, it was necessary to add an emergency subsidy. Um, this subsidy was supposed to assist 45 million with at least $150 per month, totaling around 63 billion reais per month. It's a huge amount of money. So I should also note that we have a 12% unemployment figure, and it does not include the informal economy workers, a 39, person, 39 million person population. The figure is likely closer to 32% of Brazilian population, if we include those informal economy workers. 
Um, the effect of COVID and these numbers make it easier to understand, Morgan, why both markets are seeing an increase in the COVID-related fraud. The fraudsters are basically applying existing strategies to take advantage of those new opportunities. Do you agree with me, Morgan? Yes, that's right. The sudden action taken um, by both of our governments in response to the health crisis and the detrimental impacts of those measures on the Brazilian and American economies has made cyber criminals work actually much easier. I wanna highlight a couple of themes that we are seeing with COVID related fraud. So the first is that fraudsters are not using any new technology or complicated techniques. They're applying the same attacks in slightly different ways to take advantage of the current situation. The second point I wanna make is that these rapid behavioral shifts are allowing fraudsters to hide their bad activities amongst the unprecedentedly high volumes of good transactions. So essentially hiding this bad, this bad fraud, these bad transactions in with the high volumes that are occurring in our markets um, due to COVID and the social distancing methods. And then lastly, most of these fraud schemes are initiated by social engineering. We all know um, how social engineering is implemented, but we're going to talk a bit about that. It is a pervasive theme amongst all COVID-related fraud schemes. Good. Um, we'll take the next few minutes to unpack a few of the fraud schemes that have been tailored to the current situation. Um, they include COVID testing or medical insurance fraud, unemployment fraud, COVID subsidy fraud, and also phishing. All right. Okay, so getting to COVID testing fraud or medical insurance fraud. So here in the US, we're seeing scammers offering COVID-19 tests to medical insurance beneficiaries in exchange for personal details and their medical insurance information. So they're standing up fraudulent websites that look like the official websites uh, or are promising to deliver COVID tests that have not been FDA approved and have not been proven um, or their results have not been proven. And basically collecting personal information that can then be used to fraudulently bill federal healthcare programs and essentially commit medical identity theft. Um, so what happens in this case, if the medical insurance companies deny these claims for the fraudulent or unapproved tests, essentially the beneficiary is the one that is likely going to be responsible. So you'll see this theme as well throughout our presentation. The, the one that loses obviously is, is the victim of, of the fraud most of the time. In certain cases, governments will cover, um, but this is why it's, it's an extremely big problem, especially when we're dealing with a healthcare pandemic and a lot of people are suffering. All right, jumping over to another trend we're seeing in the US, unemployment insurance fraud. So um, as I said earlier, 51 million people are currently unemployed in the US and several US states, including Illinois, Virginia, Pennsylvania, amongst others, are suffering from fraudulent unemployment insurance applications. So states are actually uncovering tens of thousands of fraudulent unemployment applications and have already paid out hundreds of millions of dollars in false claims. Some of these fraudsters are, are just independent bad actors, but some are parts of organized fraud rings. And both are, are exploiting the chaotic economic crisis and also the political pressure that states are feeling to swiftly pay out these unemployment checks without using the usual uh, security mechanisms because these are really unprecedented times. So in response to uncovering these massive fraud schemes, states or the departments of labor in each of these states have put a freeze on thousands of accounts, most of them belonging to legitimate claimants, meaning that many of the 51 million unemployed Americans are actually unable to buy you know, necessary goods. They're unable to pay their bills. 
Okay, um, Morgan, in Brazil, the cyber criminals are targeting the coronavirus financial assistance programs. Um, as the pandemic raised an unemployment rate and cut off the incomes of informal workers, um, the Brazilian government approved uh, emergency 63 billion reais per month to assist around 45 million people to handle the situation. And, at the, and the process, of course, followed that huge amount of money. Um, as an expected situation, the Brazilian government had no time to spare to implement the subsidies payments. And trying to avoid those beneficiaries to congregate in brick and mortar banks to receive those subsidies payments and spread the virus, the decision was creating a brand new mobile app as distribution channel. Hurry up to make it happen as soon as possible. Some existing identity verification strategies, such as face recognition or background check, were left behind. Um, and to open an account in this official app and receive the payment, the only required information was the ID number and date of birth. Two pieces of static information easily accessible for fraudsters on the dark web. And also, thinking about the very poor population that has no access to smartphones, this mobile app allowed more than one account to be opened from a single device. And then, Morgan, the fraudsters started a run to those accounts. And as a result, more than $278 million was reportedly stolen here in Brazil as a consequence of identity theft. And the worst has not come yet. More than 2 million accounts were blocked due a suspect of fraud, forcing those people to prove their identity in a brick and mortar bank and risk their health. These screenshots that you might see in the slides are of are the mobile app distribution of Caixa, the bank owned by Brazilian government. Um, the notification that you see in red says, your account is blocked. Please go to Caixa agency to show your ID documents in order to unblock your account. Um, that's a very sad situation. It's a cruel consequence of a uh, false positive. Unemployed and low-income population right here were denied to receive the subsidies at the time they needed the most. So the notification on the right is a login wait list. The app was so overwhelmed when we start distributing those payments. Um, they just created a digital queue. In some cases, um, users and beneficiaries just needed to wait for two or three hours. Turn to turn just a second. The phone just here. Go ahead, Morgan. <laughs> you know, the joys of working from home. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, as Dudu was saying, in some cases, uh, people would be waiting on the login screen for two to three hours until they were able to log in and access this life-saving um, funds. So that's pretty shocking. And I think it's, it's you know, depending on, on the distribution channel, it's, it's really a trend that we're seeing across the market. So let me jump into to a bit of what we're seeing in terms of COVID subsidies fraud in the U.S. So as you saw on a previous slide, the U.S. passed the $2.2 trillion CARES Act to distribute support to 175 million Americans who make less than 75,000 per year. It also includes the Payment Protection Program, or PPP, which was put in place to support 650,000 small businesses and nonprofits. Additionally, as we heard before, unemployment insurance has now become a lifeline for tens of millions of Americans without work. So in the U.S., the subsidies payments have been distributed differently as compared to Brazil. Here, we're using direct deposits into bank accounts, paper checks, or even debit cards uh, sent through the mail. But regardless, fraudsters are finding ways to, to really take advantage of the chaos and, and steal these subsidies payments. Some purchased stolen personal information off the dark web to commit identity theft and tax fraud, filing on behalf of a legitimate recipient in order to claim their payments, 
Then in other cases um, where maybe personal information wasn't available, um, they were taking advantage of the anxiety and the confusion to fish for it, sending millions of emails, standing up fake websites and impersonating the IRS or the Internal Revenue Service, basically tricking people to disclose their personal and banking information. Some sites would claim to verify individuals' filing information to ensure that they were going to receive the payments, but really they were set up to steal their identities and, and take those subsidies in their places. In other cases, scammers were socially engineering uh, via phone calls and influencing people to sign over the checks that they received or to mail them their debit cards. So really regardless of distribution technique in Brazil, it was a mobile app. Here we had several different channels. Bad actors have used social engineering and static information to their advantage. So I'm gonna jump over to our, our final spotlight on um, phishing. So last but not least, we're, we're coming to this topic that has been woven into a few of the other comments that we've made earlier. And, and no fraud conversation is really complete without touching on phishing. Um, these scams exploit human emotions like anxiety or eagerness for information or reassurance in the middle of a health crisis and they leverage trusted brand names as well to gain consumer trust. So attackers are launching phishing campaigns across channels via email, mobile messaging, social media, direct message, and others to steal login credentials or to distribute malware or to collect personal information from their victims. Another tactic they're using is to overtake legitimate email accounts or messaging accounts and then target the contact list of that user. The logic being that if the link or attachment that they're receiving appears to come from a trusted colleague or a friend, they're much more likely to open it. So while phishing has been around for you know, upwards of two decades, hackers really continue to adapt their techniques to new environments like they have done to take advantage of the realities of social distancing and remote work. And on that topic, um, as everything went digital, we saw grocery de delivery apps grow something like 400% actually across the US and Brazil. We saw Zoom, mobile active users grow a thousand percent. And this brings me to one of my previous points, which is that fraudsters are impersonating these leading communication applications like Zoom, like Skype and Google Meet by putting new phishing websites up and targeting their hundreds of millions of users. So for example, as you see on the slide, 1,700 new domains containing the brand name Zoom were created in the last few months, 25% of which were created during one week in March. And we found that you know over 5%, more than that, have contained suspicious characteristics. Just to throw a few more figures at you, phishing is the entry point for at least one third of all tracked attacks. Phishing attacks recently are up 667% since February and still trending up. And Google sees roughly 240 million coronavirus related spam messages per day. And I just wanna note um, that the Twitter incident is another example of a fraud technique that didn't leverage sophisticated technology, but relied on phishing and social engineering. In fact, as, as some of you may know, 90% of data breaches are the result of human error. And with so many people working from home, cut off from regular contact with IT security, generally on edge, generally distracted with all the other things that are going on in our lives, now is really the perfect time for hackers to test the limits of individual vigilance. Um, Eduardo, can you share what's going on in terms of phishing in Brazil? Yes, sure, Morgan. Um, here in Brazil, social engineers are taking advantage of stress and fear 
um, the uptake in digital transactions and the fact that they are new bank people using fintech apps for the very first time. Here in Brazil, we are seeing a big increase of WhatsApp hijacking to by bypass multi-factor authentication through social engineering. And I would like to tell you about the story of one of our cus current customers. So basically this customer uncovered that on someone began to follow their official Instagram account, fraudsters would reach out impersonating a customer service representative. Um, the fraudsters were relying on the fact that the majority of followers were actually users with accounts at this mobile bank app. Um, as the credentials to log in are also two static informations, ID number and passwords, the fraudsters found a way to fish these pieces. Um, they send the, vi the victims a direct message on Instagram if they recognize a big transaction in their credit cards. And of course, Morgan, they don't recognize this transaction mm -hmm. because that never happened, in fact. Um, so worried about the idea of having one of their credit cards cloned, the victims end up giving the ID number and password to the fraudsters um, who use this, who use another device to take over the account and transfer out all the available funds. Um, here in this situation, we see that the company was relying on static information for authentication in the same way the mobile bank app in Brazil um, was relying on static information for identity verification. So my conclusion, Morgan, here, after seeing so many different social engineering techniques, is that no matter how secure a uh, digital system is, the human factor will always be a weakness. What do you think? Yeah, so security professionals will you know, often point to humans as the security vulnerability or the weak point. And while we agree, consumer vigilance is incredibly important and there needs to be continued education around that in addition to how to use authentication tools, it's, it's also really important that we look for solutions that minimize the role consumers play in security. Companies that as Judu said, that are only relying on static information are likely not enough to protect their consumers. We know that stolen and exposed credentials have risen 300% in the last two years um, as a result of more than you know, 100,000 data breaches. And most of this stolen information, as we alluded to earlier, is available on the dark web, um, depending on the viability of the account, um, how much is in there, if it's a banking app, it could range from $1 upwards to thousands of dollars. So our message here is that fraud prevention shouldn't be limited to passwords, knowledge-based questions, one-time passwords, other forms of password-based authentication provide too much room for manipulation. Our suggestion is that every company should look to implement dynamic data into their risk decisioning to get ahead of fraudsters. Eduardo, any thoughts on, on takeaways? Oh, sorry, my micro was muted, <laughs> of course. Um, to give one more step ahead in fraud prevention, we have to find ways, Morgan, not relying on human factor, neither in static information. We believe here that behavioral biometrics is a new layer of authenticating person that companies need to implement to stay ahead of fraud. Let us tell you why. So um, behavioral biometrics is essentially enabling the measurement and analysis of the unique patterns in human behavior. And this is done in different ways, depending on the company, can leverage keystrokes, mouse clicks, navigation speeds, or location. And the point here is that once the pattern is developed, it then detects anomalies and suspicious behaviors at, a, at an extremely high level of accuracy while also keeping false positives low. And as we've seen in earlier slides, this 
this can make a huge difference in people's lives. Um, so it, other points of, of value prop for behavioral biometrics, it's silent, runs in the background without adding any user friction. And um, at Incognia, we use a particular kind of behavioral biometrics that is based on location behavior. Um, and, and all of these forms of behavioral biometrics are really, really difficult, if not impossible, to predict or replicate. And they can't be transferred or forgotten like uh, a password might be. So that's really all we have for you today. We hope it was informative and piqued your interest in behavioral biometrics. And we'll open it up for Q&A now. Um, please use the chat function to enter your questions in. And I know we're coming up on time. So if we don't have time to cover those, we'd be happy to reach out via email or you can email us here at Eduardo Pires at incognito.com or Morgan Grandy at incognito.com. So we'll just give it a second. So we did get one question in. Um, so the question is, are fraudsters mainly focused on the COVID related programs or is there more fraud going on in general? Yeah, so thanks so much for writing in. That's a great question. So um, the COVID related programs are, are a focus for fraudsters because it's a vulnerability, right? As we talked about social engineering and phishing techniques, this is really how fraudsters implement their schemes or rather collect the data that they need to implement their schemes. Um, but I think what's important to note here is that the sheer volume of transactions has increased um, because of social distancing and remote work. Um, and Oftentimes for health reasons, people are choosing contactless payments as well in store to avoid having to touch cash, which obviously changes hands frequently. So I don't have um, you know, exact numbers on those types of fraud, but I will say that Bain and McKinsey have adjusted their digital transaction projections to account for this significant growth. So we're pretty confident and we, we can see it in our behavior that, um, that these these fraud fraud is growing as a result of that in general. I don't know if you have any thoughts, Eduardo, on Brazil's side. Yeah, you said everything, Morgan. I agree on you. All right, great. Well, if there are no more questions, we'll thank you very much for joining us. And please feel free to get in touch if you have questions about the presentation anything we've discussed, or generally questions about incognito and what we're building. All right, have yeah. a great afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody. Hope you enjoyed. Bye-bye.